Hello everyone and welcome back to the Florida Relocation Guide YouTube channel. My name is Adam Hancock. I'll be your host once again. Today we're talking another brain dump, stream of consciousness rumination style video where I'm going to address 15 to 20-ish separate subjects that we receive via client questions, um, things I've been brainstorming, videos I've been working on, just everything that's kind of popped up in the last, let's say, 14 to 21 days around Florida real estate, Southwest Florida, the market in general and everything in between. So I hope you guys enjoy that. If you've not already joined our community group, um, it's private to just followers of this YouTube channel. Uh, most, if not all of the questions I'm gonna address today, I received as individual DMs from people, which is a feature of that group. You can message me directly. I typically answer them within 24 to 48 hours and I even try to send you a voice memo of my actual answer instead of just typing it if I can. But uh, I take those subjects and I kind of address them in an evergreen manner a lot of times. And then everything else that I have going on, all the things our agents are working on and everything in between. Um, I own a real estate brokerage called the Sunshine State Company, if you're not aware of that. So if you're looking to buy, sell, and or invest across the entire state of Florida, please reach out. We have offices in Tampa, Sarasota, and Naples. And I think that's about it. And let's just hop right into the video. Okay, the first area I want to bring up is regarding Welland Park, Florida, the master plan area, which I'm going to get into in a second. Flood zones, homeowners insurance, two really, really sensitive topics in the state of Florida right now, all the time, but especially right now, if you're anywhere remotely close to the coast. Since the question that keeps recurring is in this one particular area, that's what I want to um, uh, discuss here in this forum. So Welland Park is in South Venice, Florida, North Englewood and Western Northport. So you're the Sarasota, Florida Metro is a real quick catch up. You're south of the Sarasota city limits. This is a master plan new construction area. The newest district is called Playmore. It's 18 to 25 minutes one way to four beaches, um, which puts you 10, 14 miles ish. And um, it also backs into a river, the Mayaca River. So the Gulf of Mexico on one side, the river on the other. And that's where the flood zone thing gets brought up first. So that's what I'll address here in, uh, to start. So the new district has six, seven, eight, nine neighborhoods, but a lot of them are affected by this idea. So tricky conversation, first of all, to answer in totality. If someone had uh, the perfect answer, I, that would make me more nervous than someone trying to figure out what to tell you at all, <laughs> probably, because there's, it's not really that kind concre concrete. It's not a binary conversation. One, I don't know your specific situation. So I don't know your, your individual neighborhood, your individual house, and your timeline. That's important. But second... Um, we don't control a lot of the information. FEMA does. We don't control what happened, what it says now versus what it's going to say in five years. We don't control the weather, all those kind of things. With that being said, that general asterisk on the whole video, um, I like to focus on where I can gain the most information. So there's two main areas and then there's other stuff we can do. The two main areas are geography and your individual home plat. So the one thing you can look at, you could say, I'm looking at, um, uh, depending on how familiar you are with the area. I'm looking at Brightmoor, Everly, Sunstone, Solstice, whatever they may be. I'm looking at different neighborhoods within those districts, which gets you a little closer east, west, south, or north, depending on what they are. I have a river behind you. So the big thing here, and this goes into the insurance conversation too, is that it is coastal for sure. It's a lot more coastal than most areas. It gets more narrow on a map as you go in this direction. But you're not uh, two miles from the beach one way, right? Because of this district, it's a little bit east. Not that east, not as east as a lot of Lakewood Ranch, but it's not right on the Gulf of Mexico. So a lot of the flood conversation actually is the river, which is the east border, not the Gulf of Mexico, that, th that is the problem. So the one thing to look at is when you're looking in at neighborhoods versus each other, and then within the neighborhood, homes versus each other, is to say, on a map, elevation aside, what is the most central where I'm not in a vulnerable spot, potentially based on the phase plan build out, too close to either direction, Gulf, uh, River? That's one. That can't hurt. The second thing is a lot of these new neighborhoods, this is all individual, how high they build these things up. That's how they get out of a lot of the mandatory zones, right? Because you're whether the whole area is in a flood zone or not, this is about being in the non-mandatory versus mandatory and what the requirement of insurance is, which also contributes to the liability. If they're not requiring it, then the insurance company is probably taking a really good guess that it's not going to happen, right? Because they're not even going to take the chance. If they, if they're going to take the chance, they would require. So if you're in an X flood zone, um, you know, God willing, knock on all the wood, you're probably in a, in a pretty decent spot, but it's a moving target. So the one thing is to look at that. Then the neighborhood itself, since they know this in advance, 
they kind of know what they're working with. A lot of times they build the entire neighborhood up on a higher elevation, but every single home in the neighborhood and every neighborhood versus the other neighborhoods are not the same elevation. The best thing you can do is get the most central away from the water if, if you're scared about this kind of stuff, especially about it changing in the future, and get the highest you possibly can on individual plots within a neighborhood. Those are the two things that you can really control and you can look at them on a map, you can look at elevation. These are individual surveys within a neighborhood. So it's um, hedging your bets on top of another hedge on top of another hedge. And then um, beyond that, right? You know, a way to utilize like a team like ours would be basically to run down a bunch of unstructured data, right? Like I said, no one has a crystal ball. Most people are just gonna point you at FEMA maps, which are the accurate true reading right now. But as far as like what's gonna be rezoned later, what has exceptions? If I buy this home, they're already like applying for an exception certificate. Like where does that sit? What's my liability if they don't get that exception? All of those kind of things. Um, our team uh, can basically be a conduit between the on-site sales rep and the developer. But all of that, regardless of what anyone says, you basically have to take five, six, seven data points if you're building a weighted formula of sorts, as a simple example, and uh, give yourself enough information to say, even if something changed in two years, this is the best information I could have had at the time to make a decision. Even It's a no regrets model. So that's that. Insurance, um, and we can help with, if you want to run this scenario individually, reach out. Like this, is a, this has to be macro for YouTube, but if you, want to, you have a single address that you're trying to figure this out, let us know and get way deeper in there and juxtap juxtapose all that kind of thing. When it comes to homeowners insurance, one, it's a similar conversation as far as like, say uh, uh, someone asked a question about coastal proximity in uh, the Welland Park. I keep hearing about coastal proximity as a benefit to Welland versus Lakewood not having that. But no one's talking about homeowners insurance and the liability that comes there and the extra fees. So I would say a very similar conversation to it's not that close to the Gulf. It's just as close to the Gulf in a lot of almost identical ways as the Waterside District of Lakewood Ranch. So most people, I don't think the first thing that pops in their head when they think of Waterside in Southeast Lake and Ranch, think of coastal proximity. But if you look at the mileage to Lido Beach in Waterside, versus, I think Windward is like nine and a half miles or 10 miles one way to downtown Sarasota, which is three miles to Lido. It's very similar in a lot of parts of Waterside as it is to Welland, it's just a different beach. So I wouldn't think insurance would, would view this like it sits on the island. However, Venice has no barrier island, unlike, Sarasota is really blocked by Siesta Key, Longboat Key, all that. So that could, and, and then also um, Waterside doesn't have uh, the river behind it. So um, it's another thing where I wouldn't think a lot of stuff that happens with insurance should happen anyway. <laughs> but to me, I, I don't think they're actually materially different as, a, as they relate to the coast myself. But again, this is a scenario that you need to like not we, uh, we, we can have theories and we need to stop guessing. And any address you have, any neighborhood you're curious about, even if you haven't purchased yet, throw that over the wall and that'll only give us more data. And you can really see how the individual homes that are a mile apart relate to each other. And it's, it's kind of surprising. Okay, the next one on the surface is maybe like a narrow specific one-off question that one person asked me on the community group. But what I was trying to articulate my answer to her, I thought it might be a little bit more enlightening as far as like a value prop to the area. So I just wanted to relay what I told her. So the faux scenario, back in Welland Park, South Venice master plan, but different price point. So we're talking 2 million, let's say 2 million to 2.2. And custom home, maybe a community like Everly, maybe Sam Rogers creeps into there, but let's say Everly for now, it's a mixed builder custom neighborhood. And you're about to sign a contract, you take a step back and you're looking at like maybe an 18 month home build um, of one, do I need to spend 2 million in this area? It, it, am I buying an anomaly that I don't need to buy? This might be going through your head because when you look around, you're saying, you know, am I buying here when everything else is here? I'm not seeing a lot of the similar kind of builds other than this one community. It's a lovely district, but um, am I overpaying for perceived value? You're working through all these things most likely. I actually think it's one of the most interesting things right now is that the, the confusion and the ambiguity around the, the same questions you're asking yourself, I think is where most of the opportunity lies because I think the history of what's already happened in the past, all those same markers exist where this value makes sense, but the Playmore's district's newness is potentially the, the reason that people don't know what to do. It's too vague. 
And for, so th my thoughts are, three years ago, I was talking about, maybe four years now, I was talking about Welland Park on YouTube. And I was trying to explain to people the value of what this place is going to be or what it could be. And at that time, the Playmore, all the fun part, the Playmore district and the downtown Welland, none of it exists. It wasn't even on the radar. So I was trying to use the older communities, Grand Palm, Neil, which is built by Neil, uh, Renaissance, built by Mattamy, uh, Oasis, the built by MI Homes, all the Lennar stuff mixed in, all that kind of stuff. I was using this area to try to like sell like, you know, this is what this me means there. This is what this could be. You know, it's so interesting. And, but that whole area is really was positioned as old school Venice. It was like very nature centric. And if you've ever been to Grand Palm and it was like, but a lot of the builders people are used to that are doing all over Lakewood. So it didn't seem that different. It just seemed like a different location, but it seemed like small, a small part of like what Lakewood or Sarasota was already. Then, they, then Mattamy comes over and Master develops the Playmore district where then it starts to get exciting because it gets one closer to stuff, has a downtown, it's golf cart friendly. They have the baseball field right there, but they do the same thing. So Neil Communities hops back in, of course. This is the same thing we've always done. Um, Neil builds Windward and Grand Park and Grand Palm and Indigo. It's the same thing. Canoe Creek in Paris is hop, hop, hop. And they build two communities in the Playmore District. So that's, the, that's two of them. And then Mattamy, uh, who master plan, like I mentioned, but they build Renaissance in the old district. They put in Sunstone, a little bit more amenities, but similar kind of vibe that Mattamy always does. People actually got excited when Solstice came in because that was Toll Brothers. And because at that point, like our most luxurious builder was the Avelina community, probably at, um, in, the, in the meaningful part. It was the Neil Boutique, but it wasn't even Neil Signature. Um, but Toll doesn't do what they do in Lakewood, Rich. Like that, you know, that's people are excited about the luxurious thing they've seen in Lakewood Ranch. They do their pared down product, which they do uh, in Venice Woodlands and North Venice, which it's not like lower quality. It's just less of stuff. So it's not near as bougie as the other one, but it, it offers a, a little bit higher price point, a level of elegance that some of them weren't. And it gives you another option beyond Avelina for some boutique, more luxurious feel. But you're you're sitting in in you're sitting with like a handful of choices. They're all very different from each other. And then basically that whole district at that time, I don't know if people even remember deeply, they were really going hard after like downtown Welland's gonna be your backyard. So they were going no frills amenities, real pared down kind of stuff. And even if you had amenities, they were, like, they were all kind of pointing their flags in that direction. People were wondering, are there going to be communal pickleball courts? And like, you know, they're, everybody's wondering that kind of, that, that like luxury YMCA kind of feel to, um, because that's all you had to basically work with, right? And if you were, if you were, at, you know, looking in the Lake Club in Lakewood Ranch at one point, the Isles, Country Club West, East, you're shopping Esplanade, Azario even at the time, Waterside was just getting kicking. And, you know, all over the place, we're seeing Arthur Ruttenberg, Lee Weatherington, you had Holmes by Town, Stock, you got all these guys that have been, tr John Cannon, been around just crushing Lakewood Ranch forever. Um, you know, if you wanted that level house, like you were, say you were looking at Lake House Cove in 2021, um, trying to do the hundred, the hundred uh, lots that were custom, and you just didn't want well and it didn't work out, you don't want Waterside, maybe you had kids that were going to school and you didn't want them to go to Booker or something, and you're looking in Venice, you didn't have really a viable option that was apples for apples when if you wanted that area and you wanted this level house, that was kind of our, our crux, right? Then we add more very recently. So Everly comes out, like I mentioned, I'm going to talk about more obviously in a second. Brightmore comes out 55 and up. Lake Spur comes out. Grand Place is going. You got you know a handful of other guys. And um, where we sit in this kind of decision, I think is a really interesting tipping point of time. Because if I'm going to spend $2 million in Venice right now, I want all the hedges I can get. I want the best of what's going to happen now, the best of what's going to happen later. Because even if you don't want appreciation for, sell, uh, for making money later, so you should at least want it for value purposes of like mitigating risk. Um, and, and this is where we have all the history that's already happened. This is where this becomes more valuable. So one, Everly goes mixed custom builder only. So you have, uh, say you're going to buy the Lee Weatherington, you got Arthur Ruttenberg, you got Homes by West Bay, which is interesting, but you got these different guys, right? So what I, I, it adds texture to the neighborhood. It adds a semblance of that when people go in and buy, they respect the other builders, the level of the homes, but they might have a preference based on lot, style, could be price point, but it's a choice, but it's not like it went from here to here. So for instance, the alternative to that would be 
you know, Sky Ranch is Taylor Morrison master plan. Well, they put custom in there, right? So those two are very different products. Star Farms out um, in Lakewood Ranch, DR Horton master plan. You have, you have a 250,000 and 3 million. So that's where a divide, if you're just going purely on paper of like what's going to happen next, if you're on the 3 million side to the 250, not the other way around, then, uh, you know, these things all have some, they all have their value in particular things, right? We can't get into all that here, but it's different than it, them all being a little bit closer to each other, like a, the wild blue or something. And then on also on the wild blue subject, another thing I like about Everly is they didn't go as crazy as like a wild blue did. They didn't go like, this is the most luxurious thing of all time, $1,000 HOA, luxury condominium level amenities. They didn't go as crazy because this area right now, it might not make sense. So it went a little bit more in the middle. And then at 2 million with Lee Weatherington, if you look at history, these guys weren't really ever at $400, or $400 a, a square foot. You know, Lee Weatherington, when they built in Lake House Cove, had a model that everybody really loved. I can't remember the name of it, but it's like 2,900 to 3,100 square feet. It was just a good layout for the model. Kind of like a more luxurious version of like the Plazio by Taylor Morrison. It's that nice like three, two and a half or four, three and a half. Um, just the right fit, single story, wide lot, had all that kind of stuff. People loved it. But they were, they were selling those at $650, $750, $800 a square foot then, let alone now. So it's not like the $2 million is egregious for the, the time because all that time has passed and it still sits in a similar ballpark. And if you look at the comparables, um, it's interesting on top of that fact. And then I'll digress this point real quick. But beyond that, Welland Park has decades to go. So if I'm looking at 10 years from now, what's go, where, where it's going next and what's going to happen. One, I don't think this will be the only uh, development that sits at this kind of price point range in similar style, right? So you're going to have more like sister brother communities. Two, if I'm looking long-term future, I love the Playmore district as it exists now. I, not to say I I'm not going to like what's going to happen next, but it's, it's going to be very central to the total build out of Welland. So I think that's something good. It could get more towards Southern Englewood. It could get more towards that. So um, I like all of that. And I think there's a lot of reasons that 2 million doesn't stay at 2 million. I also don't think 2 million is a huge risk if you wait it out because I think this is still at its infancy. And this is like going three years back. If we're talking just luxury alone, this is, the, this is like not, if, you, if you just had Everly as a luxury community and you couldn't see anything else, it's exactly the way it looked. In 2020, if you had no Playmore district, people were viewing Solstice walking models at Venice Woodlands in North Venice because there was no infrastructure, right? If you can make an intelligent decision with no infrastructure where other people can't, um, I think a lot of value exists in that conversation. Okay, next up, I was asked the question, why is St. Petersburg, Florida generally cheaper than Sarasota? Now, without looking at the numbers deeply, which we can do anytime offline, I understand this is super macro, but I have a simple two-part answer to this that I think can make you dangerous enough without knowing that information, especially if you're shopping areas that, that are just broad. So St. Pete is one city within Pinellas County, which is one county within the three counties that involve Tampa Bay. It's the coastal county. All of the beaches, all the kind of stuff are in Pinellas County. The, the big thing, the, one of the biggest differences, if not the biggest difference between these two conversations is the value prop proposition in Tampa Bay as a whole is undetermined. People are choosing what they deem valuable. You have the main Tampa amenities, the main city are on one side, inland. Um, the beaches are on the other side. Downtown St. Pete and most of the neighborhoods people favor are on the bay side of St. Pete, not the beach side. So you have Tampa, you have St. Pete, but then you have the beaches in St. Pete versus downtown, 20 minutes apart, east to west, bay to gulf. So people are choosing, if they have to pick one, one spot that they deem the most valuable, which spreads out perceived value and doesn't all put it in one place, which doesn't make it as slam dunk of a decision. That's a lot of it. Sarasota, no one's arguing it. You can't, you really can't. I mean, you could, in shades of gray, you can, but 100% of the value in Sarasota always has been uh, the three to six mile square radius that involves downtown Sarasota, Lido Beach, St. Armand Circle, Northern Siesta Key, Siesta Key Village, and the in-between, which is called West of the Trail. It is one of the biggest, one of the greatest value propositions in the entire United States is everything you get in this one little area. Because the thing is the downtown of Sarasota, once you go west, you get everything. So most of the town was built on the back of that proposition. The further you got away from that kind of stuff, 
you got some sort of benefit, but you lost proximity. And then you can go in many di different directions to get far from what the minds of the people deem important, right? You could go east, west, northeast, southeast, southwest, right? So that's where the Venice thing comes up. That's where Western Bradenton is, Lakewood Ranch. They're all going in a direction. That, and then that's more of a conversation of like, okay, what's well, valuable? But most people still today are saying, okay, I get away from this to get this. Even as Venice's maturity is going, a lot of it's still there, right? It's way more clear cut. You can, you can have that argument with everyone up and down in Tampa, and it's not, it's not near as clear-cut because a lot of what people need to be close to isn't coastal. The second thing is even the homes, I think, to compare Sarasota versus St. Pete is wildly apples to oranges, right? One, um, a, there's a ton of new construction in Sarasota, weirdly. Un, an unordinary amount of master plan new construction in this kind of county. St. Pete is almost exclusively resale. Almost ex St. Pete is almost exclusively an urban district. Not a lot of suburbs, very, very little new construction that's not one-off urban infill or luxury condominiums. And if you're going to compare even the best parts of what people have this, you Google best place to live in St. Petersburg, Florida. Most of it exists, if you're just going like on a biased list, in the northeast of downtown district. It's the historic districts. It's Old Northeast, it's Woodlawn, it's St. Paul Euclid, it's historic Kenwood. And all of those are bungalow 1940s, 1950s, or older homes, it would be a much more apt comparison to compare like the, a lot of the homes in like the up and coming districts of Sarasota, like Rosemary and some of the east of the trail neighborhoods. That would be a lot more apples to apples in a lot of ways to all, to the best versions of St. Pete. And then Sarasota has all this other new construction. So the reason that it's cheaper overall is because the best parts of St. Pete, for the most part, again, this is the broadest brush of all time. The best parts of St. Pete, for the most part, are in the, the mid-tier of Sarasota when it comes to resale urban infrastructure. And then it lacks a bunch of things that Sarasota has. And then if people had to pick overall in Tampa Bay, the nicest homes in the nicest areas, they might not be in St. Pete at all. It might be in Tampa. So if you had all that going on, it's just, which creates a lot of value for Tampa, um, and this could be something you lean into, but if you're comparing Sarasota to St. Pete, it's not near as apples to apples as Naples to Sarasota would be. Okay, another one I had was kind of a value geography conversation as it relates to an example would be the Monterey community by Toll Brothers. It's a new community in Lower Lake Ranch, Florida, um, off of Fruitville. And I've had several people talk to me about almost like the suggestion that this one's like almost like in a silo like in the boonies kind of like it feels like to people a lot of times. So people are like, how do I look at this thing? What should I think about it? Is it just another aisles or, you know, what's the value here? And it's interesting to me because, you know, Founders Club, which sits right in front of Waterside, technically it's closer than all of Waterside to town. It's just on the other side of Fruitville. When I was growing up, that was the country kind of. That was where you went to get in the state house. You went past that. Then you ended up in the real country. These were my friends that had uh, like cows and horses and all that kind of thing. Um, there's a weirdly country part of like large pickup land in Sarasota if you're not aware of it, but a lot of it's out in Mayaka. And, um, and then Lake Ranch is built after that, right? But they didn't, they didn't go below university. So they're sitting on University and Lake Ranch Boulevard and the interstate and Lorraine Road's a part of it a little bit. And so, you know, it was like the knock on it was it was super far inland and you couldn't get closer than 14, 15 miles conceivably to town. And, you know, old school Sarasota, that's kind of far from the beaches in downtown. And then there was no real downtown. There wasn't like a water side out there, whatever. So you had downtown Lakewood Ranch was a little small one, a couple of shopping centers. Everybody went to town and yeah, that was the deal. Well, then they build water sides, a whole district, which the first time goes south. And there was only like three communities in it. And Windward was right there. Windward, Lake House Cove and, um, and um, Shoreview by Pulte. And the, you know, our conversation with Windward was it was the closest one because the angle of Windward on Fruitville to downtown Sarasota and the beaches, like that kind of takes away the knock. It's 9.6 miles one way. We'd show people it takes, you know, 15, 18 minutes one way. That was like a big change. That's like what Welland Park's di different distance is right now. So that that's like, you know, with, without the Playmore District, why would you go to Venice if you could, if this is the same thing. You get communal amenities and all that kind of thing. But that was the first emergence of that conversation. Well, if you look at where Monterey sits, because now we're way more built out, right? So I would encourage you to take a step back and revalue the whole value proposition. Because if you look at where Monterey sits, Windward's what, less than 10 miles, Monterey's 12.7, both on Fruitville. And Fruitville's your conduit to town. To get to town, you gotta go east to west. So it's just like I talk about the beach bridges. If you're not 
if you're above them or under them, like you got to get to them and go over. Well, that's Fruitville to town, all the stuff. You, there's no other way to get there. Um, so this is, we're talking a three, four minute differential in windward versus it's the same conversation. So, um, what, th- there's all this like called water side, not called water side, all that kind of thing called Lakewood ranch, not called Lakewood ranch. I think this is more about a circling on a map of all these communities that are in play. If you're looking for certain criteria, whatever, regardless of what they're called and going South and East isn't necessarily a bad thing because if you're on Fruitville, it's not that big of a deal. So you can kind of pick where you'd prefer to live because a lot of Lake Ranch is going probably opposite camera here, but it's going Northeast, right? So you're going to get further from the divide, but you want to be close to you. But if you go this direction right here, it's a lot closer. So anyway, um, if that's got off your radar because of that kind of feeling, I would, uh, I would try to experience it um, because where Monterey got put, I think a lot of the reason beyond the lack of like advertising and stuff by toll is that there was no reason to drive past Lorraine. <laughs> if you're going that direction from Sarasota, there was no reason to cross over Lorraine and keep going there. So if you're on uh, Fruitville, there, you're, you're already up in Lake Ranch before you get there. So I think that's part of the reason of like the, without Wild Blue and without the new Shellstone and all this kind of stuff, um, there was no reason to be in that area. It was just woods and water behind the woods that no one knew existed. So when that gets cleared up, all of Lake Ranch's future plans, I think this is gonna circle back to actually a really interesting value. So I would uh, take a second look. Okay, the next one is an update and it's for the golfer in the family or even someone that may be interested in the social lifestyle that comes with a golf kind of neighborhood. I have the latest and greatest information when it comes to what happened with Lake Ranch Golf and Country Club in the heart of Lake Ranch, Florida. I mentioned on uh, several videos a while back that we heard rumblings this is coming down the pipe that they were looking at uh, a private sale uh, of the club and the courses and uh, it was narrowed down to two like VC firms we heard at the time and all this kind of rumors were going around. Well, now it's official. So Heritage is the name of the company, Heritage Golf Group, which this is what they do, um, have purchased the club um, and this is their plan with it. And by the way, this was brought to my attention, all the detail by an agent on my team named Chris Serra. He's a great resource for a lot of reasons, but he's a member at Country Club West. Um, and uh, so he provided me the letter that was sent to them in addition to the other stuff that we've heard. But um, you can reach out to him via me. Via me is weird, but uh, <laughs> you can reach out to him through me if, um, if you're kind of trying to do something. He's really deep in the development of not just the suburbs, but the golf communities within them. So food for thought there. But all right. So as it used to sit, Lake Ranch Golf and Country Club, Two-part neighborhood, Country Club West, Country Club East was added. Um, it spans from like Lake Ranch Boulevard all the way to La- Lorraine, east to west. It's very, very central. So you have Lake Ar- you have downtown Lake Ranch, water above you, waterside right there. It's by everything because it was built like if if they had no plans to expand Lake Ranch beyond like 2008, and it was built like that, then this this is the this is kind of like central proximity. So it's in an amazing spot with where they went with it. And it's, and it's a rare community for what it has to Lakewood in general. So the course isn't deeded. So all the memberships have nothing to do technically with the neighborhood. It's just like preferential treatment. So uh, you can live in the Lake Club or the Isles or in Waterside and play in here technically if there's availability. Three courses that are private. This is the old regime. Three courses that are private, two clubhouses. The lodge is in east, the main clubhouse. It looks kind of like the castles in west. And that's kind of where you sit. There's social memberships at multiple tiers. There's golf memberships, premier golf memberships. There's a training facility. That's as it sits. So new place buys it. What, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to take the three courses to four. And the way they're doing it is kind of the way that I thought, that was my first thought when I originally heard it, is right outside the walls of, literally outside the walls, you can throw a baseball to it, from the neighborhood is this public course called Legacy. Not near as nice as the private because it is what it is. But that's the course that kind of like me and my buddies played growing up and that kind of thing because it's public. Um, and um, But it, it's just right there. It's right next to it. So what they're going to do is they're going to take the three courses to four because they not only purchased the neighborhood and everything that was with it, but they purchased that public course Legacy as well. So that's going to be your fourth course. We expect initiation. I'm going to break all this down, but we expect initiation fees, if this is relevant to you, to increase from about 65K to 85K. Um, and progressing to 100K-ish in the next year or two. So we'll see how they do that. But that's like a, that would be, a, looks like a new member thing because it's saying right now that current active Premier Golf members will not be required to pay any additional initiation fees to access Legacies Golf Club. 
So this is a grandfather in thing it looks like, and there are no immediate plans to increase golf membership dues at the moment. And this is the letter that was sent to current members. Um, okay, so let's see here. We, what do we want to address? So the fourth, course, the fourth course announcement I mentioned, the club will be making new golf memberships. These new members will have access to the Royal Lakes or Kings Dunes courses until both Cypress Links and the Legacy are reopened for member play, projected to be the fourth quarter of 2024. At this point, there are no plans to charge uh, to change the take-home golf cart program, so if you're familiar with that, they're going to evaluate that in all aspects. Tennis, pickleball, fitness, aquatics, and dining. In addition to golf, um, they're positioning as a total lifestyle company and supportive of investing in all amenities of the club, inclusive of tennis, pickleball, fitness, aquatics, and dining, like I mentioned. They're going to gain member feedback about uh, social calendars, capital investment, um, how they go about this. They already have a lot of that. So uh, I'm assuming addition, revamping, cleaning up this. I mean, a lot of this stuff was built like in, you know, 1999, 2002. So, um, so it looks like some of that's going to happen. But if they can control um, the hit on fees with current members by expansion, um, then I think that'll kill two birds, one stone. All right, let's see. So um, the new membership, this is the big one, right? Because the big problem with right now is if you, one, if you don't want to move into a golf member neighborhood just to play private golf, there's not a lot of availability. Um, and, uh, and also this one's been full forever. So like what it, all of the Lake Club, all of Wild Blue, uh, Shellstone, all the rest of the Waterside neighborhoods, like where do you golf? Because Esplanade's REO eventually is going to be mostly private once it's finished. Um, you know, Lakewood National is uh, same. It's all deeded. So uh, you could join the Ritz, I guess. And, you know, the, it's, there's not a lot of places just to, to join. Um, and if there is, they're full. So the new membership thing I think is really interesting. So their goal is to fill new membership openings. This could be important if you're not in the neighborhood. Created by adding the fourth course with family members, friends, business colleagues, referred by satisfied current members. So if you have an in, this will be the time to use it. The ambassador club status will be for our current members who refer new members. Um, and there's going to be more information they're putting out. With the strong demand for Lakewood Ranch's membership and increased capital investment into the club, they'll be offering full golf premier memberships at about a $75,000 initiation fee. This is their recent statement. And they're encouraging new members to join quickly as initiation fee prices may increase in the future, is what I mentioned before. Um, and Ressa... I never can say that word. <laughs> I don't know why I add like two, three more letters that should be there. But reciprocity um, is interesting because you might get bored of playing even if there's four courses. The local summer uh, program to play other Sarasota area private country clubs will be available as it has been in the past years. There's no inbound play from other Heritage Golf members planned until both Legacy and Cypress Links uh, golf courses are reopened. So that's going to go back and forth. Heritage Plus um, is a traveling golf network product is planned to be launched uh, to Lakewood Ranch golf members in the third quarter of 2024. So you kind of get the point here. Um, I just it was I thought it was all, the information was all necessary, so I wanted to give you all of it. Um, even if it was kind of boring, you can hop along. <laughs> hopefully, in the timestamps, if you're not a golfer. But um, the backing of Heritage, I think, is important versus like some uh, like a VC firm just trying to squeeze out like a P and L play and uh, to their portfolio. You have a club that has uh, has bandwidth. And they've done this a bunch of times. So, and they have a network. So, hopefully, members get uh, one people can play that couldn't play before, but current members benefit from the expansion as well. So, that's what I would say about that. Okay, let's have a brief conversation about HOAs. I know a lot of people are curious about this one, especially if you're from outside the state of Florida and you're not from an area that is hyper abundant with master plan, suburban kind of neighborhoods. So, you're just not that familiar with the cost and the control that comes with an association in and out of a neighborhood condominium or anything in between. Um, so, you're sitting back and saying, like, okay, I get the validity in the Sarasota or Tampa or Naples master plan environment. I like the perks of it, and I understand that association comes with that in a lot of cases. So, how do I know if I'm going to move into this neighborhood and a year later, you know, the price was this, my monthly price was this, and now it's this? Um, it changes the value proposition of what I liked. Also, how do I know in five years from now I'm not paying $800 a month? Are there things in place that people can control and limit and cap these things like they can homestead taxes, for instance? Um, so it's a very valid qu question, I think. Um, it's really interesting. And so my personal experience and, and my experience with all of my clients and my familiarity with the state of Florida is, is my point of view here, right? There's always shades of gray to all these conversations, but for the most part, 
These things can be slippery for sure. It's not an exact science, but in my personal experience, it's not that slippery. So um, let's take the, let's take an extreme example just for this context and say new construction hasn't even finished yet, long build out, multiple phases, and complexity to the neighborhood. So Esplanade Azario is a Taylor Morrison community that's in Lakewood Ranch, and this one has all the markings I just said. 1,500 homes. Because of the last few years' weirdness and supply chain and all this kind of stuff, we could say five to eight year build out. So you have multiple phases that they're going to sell the 1,500 homes over, not all at once, right? So you have all of these little timelines that are different and different times you got in, different price points, all these kind of things. On top of that, it has crazy amenities, including a golf course. So now you, know, you have a social membership deeded into your uh, house. You have a uh, or you have a golf and social membership deed in your house. Obviously, they're paying two different prices. You have multiple uh, home floor plans at different square footages, including villas and single families. So you're going to have um, you know different changes in price points and shared expenses there because not everybody's home. you have five thousand square feet and someone else is in seventeen hundred. So it's got all the kind of things that make it weird enough to have an interesting conversation. So, you know, these guys, a lot of times they'll sit and it would be very normal in this kind of neighborhood to sit. Like if you're on the social side of the membership, you might be in the range from like $280 a month to like 380 to 400 a month. And if you're in the golf membership, you could creep in that in this kind of neighborhood, not like it's, it's a moderate level of bouginess. Um, 550 to $700 a month, something like that. And you pay cart fees. Well, um, in my experience, right, these guys, one, you know, if a lot of the builders of um, neighborhoods around like Sarasota, Venice, Lakewood Ranch, that are, they're very mature and they're not small. They're super large and they've done this a bunch, a bunch of times. And it's just like when someone builds a pre-construction condominium, the, one of the biggest things with a, a condominium that hasn't been built yet, is it going to finish? So everyone's really hyper aware of like, who's the developer? Show me all the different times you've done this. Who's funding this thing? Well, in a similar vein, this is this is the same case. So you could say, like, what would make me feel better about this? Because there isn't a guaranteed control, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's um, what are all the other examples that they've done this? They they built 1,500 homes a bunch of times. They know what to charge and when to charge it. Do they back load it? Do they front load it? Do they do you start paying immediately when you get in before the amenities are built? And then and then when it's finished, and depending on who controls the homeowners association after the builder's done. It kind of basically you get to this like settling point. And from that, from every day past that point, it goes to like annual budgets, basically. And, you know, it's transparent to the the uh, the homeowners and they can have a say if they want. But we're talking like if nothing wild happens and especially in a single family neighborhood, if they're not. I mean, it's landscaping, it's fixing sidewalks, it's, you know, cleaning pools and the lakes and it's it's maintenance. So if nothing gets super weird, you might go up this year. Now it's six more dollars than it was before but most people aren't living in a neighborhood long enough in, in my personal experience again where it you have these two hundred dollar different monthly expenses than you had before the the big assessments and reserves and all that kind of stuff a lot of times um is more like boutique custom stuff or condominiums so if you're if you're looking at a condominium so i would say that with single families right i if what you see is mostly what you get other than dollars and cents here or there, depending on how you feel about that. But something would have to go materially wrong on a neighborhood that big for even it to be 50 to $100 more a month over a long period of time. It's a lot of homeowners. And so it would, that would have to be a big annual expense that came out of nowhere. And so I would think it would have to be an anomaly. Condominiums, you could throw out everything I just said. It's a different ballgame. So we'd probably have to take that one one by one. You have coastal, you have Number of units that are spread across. You have the age of the building is a big, big one. Um, how do they manage reserves versus um, how are they bleeding the assessments out? Like when's this implemented? You, yeah, it's all kinds of stuff there. So we'll, we'll, you'd have to park the condominium association. But to say you're having an $800 a month fee at 99% of the neighborhoods, um, I would think would be extremely unusual. If you have no golf um, or nothing like specialty in your neighborhood, normal amenities, like let's say no restaurant, but you have the pool and the pickleball and the bocce. It, it'd be surprising to me if you got to $500 a month. I, I think you're talking 190 to $400 a month would be, and then that would mean you probably had a decent amount of homes in the neighborhood as well. So anyway, that's what I'd say about HOA not to get too crazy. I wouldn't be too stressed about it. You know, don't, I'm not signing, <laughs> I'm not signing that in, in stone, but, um, but that's my experience. Okay, another kind of random one, but I thought maybe it would help more people than just 
The one gentleman that asked me, so say for this fake example, you're in Ohio, you, your wife, your three kids, or you, your spouse, your three kids. You're moving down uh, to Northport in Sarasota or Englewood or Wesley Chapel in Tampa Bay, and you're not going to transfer uh, with your current employers. You're going to get down here and then get uh, jobs in the same industry or a different industry. If you do all of that and you're renting a house, how long would it take, this was the question, how long would it take for a bank to approve you of a mortgage for a mortgage based on the employment being brand new, you just got into state, you're establishing residency and all that kind of stuff. So I, um, I'm not sure a lot of people know this, but I actually own a lending company that some people that are listening might have used them, but own a lending company with a partner. And the reason that I did that was um, because I was doing a lot of like, kind of specialty investments, the way even I get my own mortgages because of like business stuff and just the tricky stuff, like investor portfolios and all that kind of thing. I needed um, just more data than I had basically. <laughs> so I had a longtime partner that I'd refer, refer mortgages to, his name's Ben Perone. So basically we just decided to partner up just to make it more seamless with like the relocation kind of stuff. So um, I, I don't talk about that a ton, but um, if you're interested, he does all kinds of mortgages and he's, and he's licensed in Florida, Texas, I think North Carolina too. Um, but you can be, basically get transparent information pretty easily. So I get a lot of my data from there. But he, I asked him basically, because he's the subject matter expert. He said, if salaried employment, there's zero wait period. So he can basically get the, the thing started right away. Day one, you have proof that you have your W-2 job. Um, if you're an hourly employed, just need the a proof of the first paycheck. And then they'll probably verify that you're still there by the time it closes as well. So you're know, talking probably 30 days in, you could be good to go there. Um, and generally, you do not need, with a broad statement, to be with the same employer for any specific time period. So I thought um, I thought that would maybe put some people at ease if you're nervous about that a little bit. That's how interesting like Florida is with um, with like a right to work state. Um, that's it's interesting how serious Florida takes W two employment. Like you could be you could have a job for like a minute and act, and they'll treat your job like you've had it forever. This is always my problem with like the job the W two versus owning a business. Or you could like be independent and not have two years of tax returns or like depending on how you orient your business. And you could be making loads more money than you make at a salary job, but they treat it like you have no job. So um, yeah, I thought, but I think a lot of, a lot more people are hourly and salaried than they're completely independent. So anyway, just food for thought. All right, my friends, that is a wrap for this week's version of Adam's Ruminations Ramblings. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. We are going to put out a lot of different stuff through 2024. My goal is to help people up here in the search. You're just trying to even get you're familiar with Florida versus Texas, let's say, and help people down here that are deep in the weeds of two years of research that want to pull the trigger. So if you hop around the channel, you'll kind of see that. I'm trying to um, do a, a lot of videos so that I can provide for all of that for everyone along the way. And then hopefully you can maybe enjoy all of it at once. Beyond that, the school group, so my new community group, um, it's a members only group, it's private, that where you just can get, this is where I get a lot of information for a video like this. It just uh, gets you stuff that you can't get elsewhere. One, you can ask me specific questions. Um, when I have the time, I, as much as I can, will answer you just like this. I'll just drop a voice memo to you and tell you my response to anything you ask. So that's access that we don't really have elsewhere. Um, you can drop in, in the dashboard of the feed, just like a Facebook group kind of. You can ask questions. Community members are jumping in saying, I live in this neighborhood too. Like what's going on with flood zones? What's going on with hurricanes and insurance? Um, anytime I build any free guides, I drop them in there first. Um, I try to when I can, um, these are long form videos, but when I'm working through stuff throughout the week, say I might put out a monthly version or something, I try to drop all my thoughts like brain dump occasionally like i'm working on these five things like just food for thought you know so anyway it's just like better access or whatever but it's been really enlightening i think we're getting like i think it's been really helpful um, it's helpful to me i think it's helpful to crowdsource information with the members so join that it's absolutely free it's in the description box below like up in the top just look for the link that says private community group um uh the sunshinestateco.com uh that's where all the free guides are at we revamped the newsletter uh so the most i don't know when I'm going to post this video, but the most recent one that of the revamp should have went out April Fool's Day, I think, April 1st. We're going to do it every 30 days. We, we're, we're good about, I don't like the email spam stuff at all. So we're, we're good about that. I push down that ethos to everyone in my organization. So I want to send you one, two really impactful things a month unless you ask for more. So that's what our newsletter is. It's like a every thought I have <laughs> um, 
in one bullet point format that's just like a simpler version than what I'm doing here. So join that, um, email me and ask for it and or go on the website. There's there's a button in the footer, I think, where you can just join directly or all that kind of stuff. And finally, if you're looking to buy, sell and or invest in the state of Florida. Uh, so, you know, we're headquarters in Sarasota and we are no doubt most heavily in Southwest um, Gulf Coast. So all of Tampa Bay, all of Sarasota Manatee, all of Lee and Collier, which is Naples, Fort Myers area. Um, but we serve the whole state. So I lived in the Panhandle for a long time. We've we've done a lot of business in the Vero Beach, Boca. Uh, we have agents that have uh, from South Florida up to Jacksonville. So wherever you want to do, we can help you, even if it's um, even if it's connecting you with someone that could help you. Um, mortgage, real estate, anything in between. The Sunshine State Company. So please consider reaching out. All the contact information will be below. And I think I am officially out of words for this video. So thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I'm really enjoying these style videos. Um, and we'll see you on the next one.